open a little bit over a year ago, February of 2018. So with me getting into this industry, it's more about bringing people together. Um, this was a social experiment for me. I've been in the cannabis industry almost 10 years now. I uh, started with branding, marketing, and distribution. So I helped a lot of the bigger cannabis brands break into the urban community. And after I kind of pulled myself back out of working for people and branding these other companies, I took on this project more as a social project and to give the community something new that it needs. With, I'm not sure if any of you guys are familiar with the social consumption laws and how they run now. Uh, prior to last year, there was no safe place to, for tourists or locals to come socialize and enjoy cannabis in the social atmosphere. So I have a background in running nightclubs and things as well. So I felt it was fitting to kind of take a leap and see if something like this would work and how it would bring people together and how people would interact with cannabis versus alcohol. So opening this, um, we run as a private night, a private establishment because the city hasn't allowed us to get a license for public consumption yet. There wasn't one av available to businesses like mine to kind of establish. So I, had, when I first opened, it was under a private, um, kind of private residence kind of rule where you can invite your friends over, you can smoke weed. Um, so we run like, the business platform is more like a gym. So every room runs or signs up for membership, waivers and saying you won't die from smoking marijuana. So over the last year, um, I've hosted people from over 25 different countries, 40 different states, and to see how cannabis actually brings people together and how people interact is it was one of my goals. And compared to a bar or nightclub, we've had very, we've had zero instances <laughs> where we have had any disagreements or anything. It's been more of a social interaction piece. People come hang out, we have video games, live music, anything that encompasses the cannabis culture art, music, just the socialization of it, we like to provide that here. Um, so that's pretty much where Tetra was came upon. <laughs> how, you, how should people see Tetra locally? Um, a very safe place, a new social um, aspect to life where you can really interact with people from different cultures, visitors from different countries and really have a chance to understand how cannabis brings people together and something a necessity to the community where we're giving people the chance to learn different aspects of the cannabis culture, education, um, and that it's not as dangerous as a drug that was once perceived. It really brings people together and adds a very safe environment and enjoyable environment for people to consume cannabis. And since I was the first, I was pretty much kind of used as a test dummy for the market. But like, oh my God, this guy is gonna <laughs> have a whole bunch of pot zombies walking around right now. <laughs> but it, that's far from the truth. Um, so the lack of regulations was one of my biggest issues. Um, but now with getting the Hospitality Bill Act, which will provide space or opportunity for spaces like this, not just nightclubs and lounges, but restaurants, salons, yoga studios, to kind of embrace what cannabis brings to our culture and go forward with some kind of guided regulation. So I kind of set my own at the beginning, very strict, of course, but now having something that everything would line up to what I'm trying to um, achieve with opening these lounges and providing the entertainment and a social aspect to the cannabis community and just business-wise. 
So say you go into a restaurant and you order a meal, there'd be no way to test a whole meal for the exact THC milligram dosage on every plate. So I think that it's gonna be a huge hurdle. But I think um, edibles and different cannabis dinners have been popping up around the city. But I think that will be one of the harder things to kind of get tuned in where you're adding the exact amount of THC to each meal where you're not, it's always on even playing field. So I think we're probably still a couple years out from having restaurants that serve THC infused meals just because of the testing things and stuff like that. With the hospitality bill, it kind of gives people a lead way to get more information and structure it, but I think it's still a little, little ways out. Initially, it's gonna be more of a separate thing, so if a restaurant does want to have people consume, it would be more off on the back lounge and things like that, where it'd be a smoking lounge, something like a cigar bar or, or something closer to that, vape lounge or something, but having infused dinners, like made to, in, to go or made to order infused dinners, I think, like I said, it, it's, it's gonna be a very difficult hurdle. Um, compared to bars down on Lodo and things like that. I've never had any altercations, police call, no one's ever literally, literally died from smoking weed. So I think um, if it's formatted right when the rules and regulations are finalized through the governor, I think um, it's gonna be a wide open area. So a lot of people wanna smoke weed and do yoga go get their hair cut, smoke weed in the waiting lounge. So I think there's a lot of different um, ancillary consumption concepts outside of lounges and nightclubs. Pretty much when I opened, there was no kind of format. Um, only thing that was set in stone was you cannot consume cannabis open, to, open and public. So my premise was to get a private establishment, kind of like a um, country club or uh, cigar bar, any kind of private membership club to kind of format the process where I can explain to them it's not open or it's not public. I can, all of the, all my members willingly volunteer to come in here, sign their membership form, just like a 24 hour fitness or you would say. And that's pretty much how the ground level, the legality started. Um, and really just finding a location that was kind of open to it because there's a lot of zoning issues that are gonna go around with, go around with the new laws. Um, but I did a lot of research. I've been in the industry for a long time and was doing cannabis events a couple, for a couple years before I even opened this. The initial license that was available was the DCA license, um, which like the coffee joint and vape and play hat. So, that gave people the ability to vape and do edibles inside of establishment open to the public. But from my experiences, um, you don't want a visitor from Florida coming down that it's, joints are universal. <laughs> you can smoke a joint, know when to put it out. But having, this is more of a tourist attraction than a local thing because most of us, if we live here, we can smoke weed at home. And unless you want to combine the entertainment aspect to it while you go out, um, music and things like that. But um, with the concept of the DCA, where you can just go to a bar and smoke your vape pen or do dabs, it was a little unsafer because of the high potency of these things for tourists that have never seen a dab. And taking 100 grams of edibles and things like that, I've uh, seen that that has a crazy effect on people that have never had it or don't have the education behind it. They just come here, go to a dispensary, be like, hey, what's the best thing you got? Here's this 90% TAC dab. <laughs> they go out and they're asleep somewhere. <laughs> but I don't think anything further will prohibit um, this kind of industry from growing here locally. I think, um, with working with the city and things like that, we kind of gave them a format to make it a safe, enjoyable place for 
locals and visitors as well. I still can't market to the public just because I'm a private club, but being um, in the industry like I've been and already been hosting events, but I was doing events only on Sundays. Once a Sunday we did uh, the MMJ Showcase, which was kind of a weed flea market where we had different vendors from product companies around Colorado explaining their product and the processes to end consumers, not because a lot of the industry marketing now and sales, no more business to business. So as an end consumer, it was really hard for you to get the information about these products. You just see magazines and things like that, but nothing in depth where you're getting real valuable knowledge about these products and the effects and how the process is made and things like that. So going into that, I kind of just transitioned my one day into seven days. It took, uh, it's still a growing process, so it's not where it's going to be. It's not where I want it to be, but it's going on the right track. No, we'll still be under strict marijuana guideline policies, I'm sure, but it will be open. Like, we will have different opportunities. You hear radio ads for marijuana and things like that. Um, my, my main focus is keeping my membership um, where I can target people 21 and up. So I work with a lot of different dispensaries doing pop-ups and things like that, um, different concerts, events, and sponsoring, kind of the unique ways cannabis is you learn how to market weed here locally from highway signs, <laughs> cleaning up highway signs. So we've got pretty creative with marketing, but I think it'd be a lot easier for me where, because I host different celebrities and DJs and things on a weekly basis that play at Cervantes, but I'm not allowed to tell anyone outside of my social media circle and membership platform. So I'll be able to kind of open that up a little bit more with magazine ads and things like that. We follow all the rules and regulations of the MED, so we can't bring in more than an ounce of flour at a time. Um, really work with mad mothers against drunk driving on kind of getting the driving and consumption thing kind of laid out to keep our members safe as well as the community. But marketing, we all, everything's personal. So if you're here taking pictures, that's your personal account. Just like my accounts are pretty much private, but they're my business personal accounts. I think I had an advantage because I was really good at selling drugs as a kid. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was more knowledgeable about how to interact with the different um, cannabis consumers already. So from selling weed to Boulder to Park Hill to the East Side, to <laughs> you really interact with so many different people. And I still think that's kind of missing in the cannabis industry. Now it's kind of getting corporatized and they're kind of targeting or trying to cre create new clientele. So going out to Highlands Ranch and pretty much adding high-end products to try to get a higher-end clientele, but cannabis clientele has always been on a general platform. Like everyone wants good weed, no one wants bad weed. <laughs> it's just how you interact with them, how you talk to them and get their message across on why and how they use cannabis. Um, on the financial end, of course, there's a lot of different setbacks because you can't take loans out for weed companies. Man, me, I started this with $8,000 <laughs> from the business and everything and grew, grew it to what it is now. Past broke even in my first year. Um, but there's a couple different aspects on both ends. You could look at them disadvantages or advantages, but I think everyone has the opportunity to kind of chase their dream. Colorado is a lot of, little oversaturated, so if you're, I, I think as a black male, if I draw, if I introduce a product to the market, I would kind of have, I would have an advantage targeting the urban community and know exactly what I'm doing and how to interact with people that want a new vape pen or try a new strain of flour. And I think that on the other end, it's harder for 
older white males that <laughs> are to try to get that message across. So there's a wins and losses in each, on each side. Last year, 420, um, we had the police coming because we always had a big parties, but they signed up for membership, which waived all their law enforcement rights and things like that. <laughs> so they uh, signed up for membership, came in, took some pictures and things like that, wrote me a ticket for public consumption. Then I took my waivers with the police's name on it, saying I can, I will sue you. <laughs> and everything was dismissed and I haven't had any problems since. <laughs> These social lounges, like this feels like I made my home feel like Colorado. So <laughs> we have different games and it gives off that Colorado vibe. So when you come, it's a very chill atmosphere with the music and things like that. I think different cities are gonna adapt that, this concept to the personality of each city. So if you're in Vegas, it might be a lot higher stream. If you're in Puerto Rico, it might be on a beach with <laughs> coconuts or whatever it is. Um, but I think for the concept I hope I've provided so far, it's pretty much safe. Everyone feels comfortable, welcome, and I think that would be easily adapted to each city, even for tourists, because for Colorado, the biggest reason people come here is work and weed and ski. <laughs> so really providing them that Colorado energy and atmosphere. And I think it could be easily um, executed in different cities, just providing that city experience. And if it's faster or slower, but I think it'd be very easy to kind of adapt something like this to each market. I'm open every day, 11 to 10. Sunday through Wednesday, 11 to midnight, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, tetra is short for tetrahydrocannabinol, so THC. So, and my logo is the Delta 9, which is the molecular structure of cannabis, or THC. Pretty much with how new the cannabis industry is, the industry's wide open, especially in different markets but really get knowledgeable on what you're trying to achieve. I don't do it for anyone else. You have to come up with a plan and target your demographic or whoever you want your products really targeting. So I would say uh, really just keep your eyes open, focus on what you're doing. It's, uh, right now it's not about the industry being white and black at the beginning of the thing because this is still post prohibition. So you can be a marketing company, you can do cannabis videos. So there's a whole bunch of different ancillary um, businesses that still haven't been adapted into the industry. So I wouldn't focus on something that's super oversaturated. You have to really create a brand initially because dispensaries at this point are becoming like liquor stores. And liquor stores don't run off of their marketing and things like that. They run off the brands that they sell. So you don't see commercials for a liquor store, but you see commercials for Don Julio or Jameson or Coors Light, Bud Light. So it's a brand driven market and that's where the industry's going. Distribution, everything's ran pretty much brand driven. So if you don't create a brand, you're pretty much kind of failing at that point if you're looking for a sellable product. Um, we just have our website, so all our membership information is on tetralounge.com. You go on there, register for membership, sign the waivers. Um, we have daily, three-day, monthly memberships. Um, we provide pretty much all the smoking apparatuses and utensils, water and things like that. Um, but we have really strong ties with a lot of the dis dispensaries and products out here. So first thing a tourist goes into a dispensary to ask after they buy their weed is like, where can I smoke this at? 90% of the time they send them here. We haven't had uh, any real issues with overconsumption at this point. Um, we do have guidelines where someone does pass out, make sure we minister CPR, call the authorities and make sure they're healthy, um, but we kind of inform 
every tour, especially from southern states and where we, the elevation will get you here. So if you're coming up here and you just think you're about to smoke 10 of these <laughs> joints that are stronger than anything you smoked in your life, we kind of inform them, kind of take your time, drink, drink a lot of water, stay hydrated um, is a main thing. And just kind of play it by ear, but we haven't had any crazy issues as of yet. So in college, I did a lot of event promotion and marketing. I helped open a lot of the clubs down. I helped Brandon do a lot of marketing for a lot of the Denver clubs. Um, that's kind of how I got into the legal marijuana industry, um, hosting a lot of different marijuana events. But in college, throughout college, um, I kind of marketed GM a lot of a few different nightclubs in the downtown area. Nothing. I like this way better. <laughs> It's easier to deal with high people than drunk yeah, people. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's a new technology for dab rig. So it's conductive, heated. So you put these little metal shards in there, and it's a cleaner way to heat your dabs. I've never seen anything like this before. But when he came in here, <laughs> he brought this big suitcase. <laughs> and I was like, what is this? He was like, this is a dab rig. I was like, I've never. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I, I'm still kind of iffy on how to use it. My dab tenders know how to use it. But I was like, you have to, it's a new way to, new heating element for weed. He'd be better to explain it for you. because. <laughs> but this was one of those products I've never seen before. Um, and the edibles are always uh, new products I've seen thousand milligram edibles now. I'm like, you might die <laughs> not to eat that. So it's like, um, and like I said before, I think joints are more universal. So we see more people more interested in smoking joints or blunts because this is, it's always been how it's been across the country. You don't have to explain someone here. You might have to roll a joint for them, but you don't have to explain to them how to smoke it. I have three employees or three volunteers. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, we, uh, we run during the day. We're just a day lounge, so we get people that come in with their laptops, do work, hang out. Um, we, and at night, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we run like a nightclub after nine. So we have different bands, different DJs, different appearances, and guests come by to kind of at uh, the whole entertainment aspect of social consumption because everyone can just so sit around and smoke weed and chill but to have somewhere where you can really enjoy the things you like while you smoke weed music different artists showcase their art on a weekly basis things like that and very targeted events to cannabis we get a lot of tourists that are not familiar or even know anything about dabs and they come here try to try one. Um, our dab tender pretty much walks them through the process, how to use a rig and safe, safely make sure they are not consuming too much, overdoing it and explaining their product to them. Because when you go into a dispensary, they pretty much want you in and out. So they're like, what's the best one? Here's some water hash. <laughs> and they bring that here. Our dab tender is pretty much explains the process of making the dab that they're smoking, all if it's brut um, butane or CO2, um, and walking them safely how to consume a dab, and working all the dab rigs and apparatuses that I have no idea how to use. After the hospitality bill goes through, um, that was a very, since I was working in a gray area for the first year, um, that was one of the hangups. If I was selling anything, it'd be a public business right. with a sales tax license. But with that going through, we we do uh, sell a, or like apparel and things like that. But that's pretty much in-house okay. things like that. We don't have torches. You can't use torches inside because couches are crazy flammable. <laughs> um, but we do have a patio area where you can you bring your own rigs and torches and things like that. Um, pretty much. Everything's our safety concern. So when you're coming in 21 and up, making sure you have the legal amount of cannabis on you, we don't check you, but letting you know that 
the, the regulations still stand here. We can only have an ounce. And um, really just making sure the consumption's not, like someone's not over here doing whole gram dabs and things like that. But providing water, making sure people stay hydrated. And overall, like I said, we haven't had any problems. So our safety <laughs> standard has pretty, been pretty good. My goal is to be one of the first nationwide cannabis clubs where I would, locally, I'm working on, like I said, like different yoga studios and ancillary things where people would enjoy to smoke weed while they're getting it, <laughs> before they get their hair done or uh, yoga or fitness, gyms, everything like that. But for Tetra as a brand to kind of emulate this throughout a few states across the country um, with be really just becoming like the hard rock cafe or <laughs> of cannabis where we're providing different entertainment and social aspects of cannabis to each kind of section of the world. <laughs> next will be uh, Vegas, hopefully early next year. Um, but it's pretty much for me as a waiting game. I can't just pop them up everywhere now. <laughs> but it's uh, with Denver kind of giving me the lead way to have a proven concept mm -hmm. of this for the years with my members, with all the feedback I've gotten, safety regulations, concerns. Um, I think it'd be very, it's a stamp and print model. So more of a franchise, I don't want to run every one of them, <laughs> but I definitely want to give people the guideline to run it in their unique community. The perception of secondhand marijuana spoke, smoke, I think the perception is kind of are we don't have the research on it quite yet, but with different ventilation systems that are coming along, um, I think we can kind of regulate the secondhand smoke with different like filters and exhaust systems that will be put in when we're open to the public. So, till we have further, further knowledge on, I don't think firsthand marijuana smoke is that detrimental to your health. So, till we figure out what secondhand does, I can't really have <laughs> too much of a con uh, understanding. But really, just making sure we're ahead of the time. So, when they do have different exhaust air filtration systems being on top of that as soon as possible. You're talking to university students. Do mm. you like that or not? It tells why. <laughs> yeah, I, I love kind of explaining. I was in college for a couple weeks myself. <laughs> so to have the honor of speaking to you guys from where I've been, I definitely love it.